journeys. It began one late night with a thought. There are other countries out there. The thought was not one of survival or upward mobility or even one it began based one late on night disappointment. With a thought. The thought was an opening, a liminal piece into possibilities. In the face of narrowing and darkening options, it was November 3rd, 2004. Portugal, Italy, Greece, Costa Rica, New Zealand, Ireland, Canada, Canada, oh yes, Nova Scotia, August 1970, a terrain we biked that contained only uphills. It was 4 a.m. Google, Nova Scotia, real estate. First click, a renovated church on the water. The therapeutic fantasy spun its way through yoga studio, cafe, community gathering place. We would live over or behind the store. But no, we stayed. We decided on hopeful, reconstructive work, teaching and learning about the biology of democracy in this purportedly democratic land. Our American dream then was one of progress on a human scale. We created and seeded online communities fostered investigative fact-finding, participated in thoughtful conversations about the improvement of policies, promoted peace, care of the planet, active, empowered citizens and communities, and resilience of mind and body. Democracy depends on such informed activism. My tagline in those days was a quote from Abby Hoffman. Democracy is not something you believe in or something that you hang your hat on. It's something you do, you participate. Without participation, democracy crumbles and falls. Our version of the dream did not include invading other countries, state-sponsored torture, high-stakes testing of children held hostage, continuing blind destruction of the environment, nor a bloated military budget that provided bombs and drones, but not body armor for young soldiers. Nor were we interested in the race to power, or scaling up, or throwing people under the bus, or political machinations, veiled racism, overt sexism, mean-spiritedness, three years later. Facing a crisis of faith in fellow countrymen and seeing very little light through that ever-narrowing portal into sustainability and community, I went online again. There was the church for sale again. It's a sign. Suddenly, everything pointed northeasterly. Richard, I said, it's time. We were weary, yes, but we were also ready. The burden of stuff, of conflict, of nastiness and short-sightedness was clear, and the lure of possibility was palpable. We flew to Halifax. We looked at the church. It was kind of a mess. But it sat overlooking water, and it felt good to be in that place. So we made an offer. The same day, someone came along with cash and bought the church. But we could not forget the air and the water and the sky and the spaciousness. Without thinking about it too much, we got our Capitol Hill house ready for sale. We purged many items. We painted. We put the house on the market and sold it three days later for more than our asking price. Talk about signs. Richard flew to Nova Scotia, met with real estate agent Bob, and saw five houses. 
When he went into 1695 East Papeswick with the porch overlooking the North Atlantic and the pine trees and the apple trees, he called me and said, I love this house. Okay, I said, okay. And so we did. All of this is prelude, however, because what you need to understand is how this journey continues and evolves and shifts, just like the fractal place we call our heart home. First of all, we discovered community. And although I am talking about very nice people who are neighborly and helpful, there's more to share. Community is visible, it's dynamic, it's forward-looking and historically smart. Our neighbors know the land, the sea, and the weather, and they understand their fragile relationship to it all. No debate exists about climate change and whether it is man-made or real. People act as if we do not have all the time in the world to solve the current and coming challenges. Several are off the grid, others are partly off. And when there was a hurricane headed our way, no one who pooed it. Fill the bathtub. Make sure the Coleman stove works. Don't open the fridge once the electricity goes out. And come to our house. We have a generator. You see, they've been through climate change disasters. They know the sea level's rising. The storms are getting worse. They know there's not much the government can do about it. The people must act. Now, this is not a group of libertarians or survivalists. These are parents, married couples, gay and straight, older folks, smart, entrepreneurial children. They are empowered, progressive, and determined to keep the community visible and sustainable. You know, socialists. The biggest surprise about finding the community is that we thought we were seeking a quiet and more or less private place, one where we might get to know a few neighbors, but one far away from politics and related concerns. That's not the case. When we arrive, the first stop is Dobbins Bakehouse, where Paul the Baker reigns over whole wheat locally produced wherever possible and free trade products. The smell of cinnamon buns draws you. You cannot pass by. From Paul, we hear about things that are new in the community. Paul used to work in IT. He left when he publicly criticized a new piece of software that he was training people to use. He went to the local community college and studied baking techniques. Now, he refuses to use email or Facebook or any online communications tool. You have to dial the phone to see what's offered for the day. When we arrive, however, we already know a great deal about what's going on in the community because everyone else is on Facebook. The Friends of Martinique Beach, the Old School Community Center, the Eastern Shore Mental Health Group, the Farmer's Market, the Deanery Project. Facebook is the community bulletin board in town meeting, wrapped in one. The intensity of the social scene is not based on party. All of celebrations and gatherings, especially musical and spiritual gatherings, are common weekly occurrences. The most intense efforts are community-based activism, directed at preservation and sustainability. Sunday mornings, everyone shows up at the farmer's market. Hours-long discussions ensue. Between runs on Jim's vegetables or Shelley's lamb sausages and Maureen's chicken pot pies, or 11-year-old Piper's jewelry. Friday nights at the old school gathering place, a building the community bought and made more environmentally sound. There are movies, youth empowerment, social activities, and once a month, a community coffee house in which old and young play, sing local ballads and original songs, fiddle, get up and dance, often across generations. 20-year-olds with blue hair and feathers hanging from their ears play the guitar, and sing soulful original songs, accompanied by 60-year-olds on the fiddle. No one is invisible in this place. Who you are is clear to all, and that's just fine. What can you do? Just ask. This 
is the heart of the world. No, really. It's the actual heart of the world. In the ancient unicontinent of Pangaea, Nova Scotia is up against West Africa, and therefore the geologies of the places are quite similar. There is, or was, gold and silver here, for example. And coal, all that's gone now with devastating effects and a need for vigilance as profiteers use poison to try to extract the last molecules of these precious elements. But in Pangaea, Nova Scotia is at the heart of the landmass, the place where in an embryo the heart would be. The heart has been separated from the rest of the body, connected only through a small isthmus, one that gets pounded by the Bay of Fundy tides daily. Hurricanes can come straight up through the Atlantic and hit the coast directly. The heart of the world is vulnerable, and yet still it beats, still loving and being loved by Mother Earth. The rest of the world is brittle, shattering often. Things fall apart, break down. But this place is fractal. The smallest piece contains the whole world. To be here is to be reminded of small places, of fragility, but also strength, the power of the human heart to love its life. This, then, is our American dream come true.